Hi everyone, Michael Rubenfeld here, uh, recording from Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I was born. And the handsome fellow sitting next to me is my father. Are you gonna wear your glasses? Do you wanna wear your glasses for the whole time? Do you wanna <laughs> take them off? Because you're gonna get glare in your glasses. You can keep them on if you want. What would you prefer? Doesn't matter. All right. Uh, now that we've got that settled. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm taking this opportunity to do an interview with my father. This is the second interview that I've done. The first one I did was with my friend Jonathan Garfinkel. Some of you might have seen that. And this time I've got my father. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? My name is Carrie. I'm Michael's Canadian father. <laughs> As opposed to my, my Polish father, who's a completely other person. The reason that I wanted to interview my father was because I thought it might be interesting to have a conversation about your uh, relationship to Poland and how it's evolved uh, and why it's evolved uh, for a couple of reasons. One, a lot of people who watch uh, what I make are Polish people and a lot of my content's Polish Jewish stuff. Um, and I have talked a lot in the past about my own journey going from somebody who grew up not uh, liking Poland, someone who grew up thinking that Poland was the asshole of the world, uh, because that's what I was taught um, by, you know, my family and my schooling and the Jews around me and survivors and everyone to, of course, now living in Poland, which I, I do now. And I thought it might be fun to kind of talk about where you started in your relationship to Poland, or maybe how, maybe you could talk about how you were raised, uh, being a child of, 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 a, of a Holocaust survivor, um, and what your relationship to Poland was, or, or had been, uh, in your life, say, prior to you starting to come there because I was living there? We are what's referred to as second generation survivors, mm -hmm. which means that our parents, uh, grandparents, um, are first generation or um, survivors of the Holocaust. And that's what they are. They're, they're just survivors. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of our families were wiped out. Uh, at least from my late father's side, um, and um, many um, uh, are of Polish origin, Polish descent, um, although they lived in uh, southern France um, during the war. When did they move to France? Do you remember that? After the First World War, and um, when there were uh, pogroms from the uh, um, Re Russian Russian Revolution, mm -hmm. so it was to escape after the uh, First World War. That's when my um, my Zeta or my late grandfather um, made his way to another country, mm -hmm. and um, my late father was born in 1924, 20 no 25, um, and they lived in France until they, they emigrated to Canada in 19, starting in 1950. Mm -hmm. And they, and they, uh, and how did they survive? They survived in hiding in southern France, in Vichy, France. They survived um, at the courtesy of um, French farmers and uh, some partisans, uh, French resistance who my father was a, a member of and um, different um, children. There were three, my father and his two sisters um, and his mother and father um, um, were um, placed with um, different um, French, kind French um, farmers or um, sympathetic to uh, 
um, sympathetic to to Jews and their persecution. Mm -hmm. And their parents were 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 immigrants from from Poland. Originally from Poland, yes. Mm -hmm. Your great your great great grandparents. Oh no, your grandparents. My grandparents, grandparents, right? Do you remember where from where in Poland? Um, I was always told that they came from the area uh, of Przemysl. Okay. In eastern okay. Poland. From Przemysl. Uh, some small village, some shtetl um, that um, was near that district. Hmm. It's interesting because Przemysl has like, become very known now in Poland as like, as like a hub for Ukrainian refugees. Mm -hmm. So I grew up hearing Przemysl also. Uh, and so to hear that Przemysl has become such an important first stop for Ukrainian refugees uh, uh, leaving, leaving Ukraine because of the war was very funny to have it recontextualized for myself in my brain. My grandmother used to refer to it as Przemysl. Przemysl? Was that the Yiddish uh, name for it? I didn't know that. I think so. So that was a long time ago. And uh, we grew up here in Winnipeg. And in terms of our relationship to Poland and what happened to the, the Jews there, you know, the, the narrative we always uh, held, I suppose, like in our minds and hearts have, has always been quite negative, as, as had been our relationship to that part of the world. Would you agree with that statement? Well, interesting. Um, my, my grandparents would talk more about Vichy, France. And um, my grandmother could never refer to uh, um, the collaborationist uh, Vichy government without referring to uh, the marshal and calling him Marshal Petain. <laughs> it was always referred to um, with uh, uh, a lot of disgust because he capitulated um, to the Germans um, after the invasion. And of course he was tried and hung after the war for that reason. So I can't put my finger on direct uh, family um, hatred of Poland, but I think it was just a community. Uh, there, this is, there are a lot of survivors in this community um, who came um, as refugees or were sponsored here after the war from uh, at various uh, refugee camps. And it was just a known thing that um, the Poles were all anti-Semitic. The Poles, uh, or Poland, is a country that is just covered and flowing with Jewish blood. And it was where three million Jews um, were murdered. Um, the greatest uh, population of Jews um, in the world at the bef before the war. Mm. Uh, I never heard anything good about Poland. Um, not even the the times where things were were good, and um, never heard about any of the welcoming stories or Poland welcomed Jews um, in um, in rec well in past history or um, um, what's the name of the um, Polish um, general? Piłsudski. Right. Piłsudski. Piłsudski. Um, how he was a friend of the Jews and uh, things were good for the Jews until he um, died, I think, in the mid... 35. Like 35, 36 is what I remember, what I've learned since. It's funny, it feels to me a little bit like um, in everything that I understand about like this history uh, in Poland, it's like, it seems like from 35 on, like the things got so bad after Piłsudski's death that the, that the narrative around anti-Semitism that we have gotten, that Jews have, have gotten about Poland, is this very is this period between thirty five and 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 then the beginning of the war and then the war it's, itself, um, and like you said, like you never heard anything good about Poland uh, growing up. You only heard that that Polish people were were anti Semitic. But at the same time, we now know that we know that that's not actually the the, the, the case because 
you know, Piłsudski himself was a friend to the Jews. He was like, you know, a big, big Polish name, a very important Polish person who was, right? That is interesting because I know very little of the period from his death until 1939 when uh, Poland was invaded. So uh, uh, I'm curious now what happened in those four years. My understanding was that there were, uh, as a, there was a situation of gradually increasing anti-Semitism, anti um, native anti-Semitism among the Poles. And was that the case or did, did it really emerge um, after the, uh, after the invasion. In well, September. it was actually after Piłsudski's death, there was one particular political party that started to r rise in power, and it was incredibly anti-Semitic. And it really fanned the flames and really encouraged the amount of anti-Semitism. They were really like encouraging people to want to get rid of the Jews after Piłsudski's death. So it was systemic in, in Poland. Of course, there was anti-Semitism that existed. This particular party, I feel like they were the Social Democrats or something like that in Poland mm -hmm. that were very, very anti-Semitic. They were very, very responsible for like things going south. I want to continue to talk about basically like at what point that narrative started to shift for you. And I remember, I remember I had this very like interesting moment with you. I don't know if you remember this moment when you when you met Magda for the first time, Magda, my, who's my wife, and we were having this kind of conversation. It was in Ottawa. I sort of surprised you with her. And, you know, you had known that I was already going to Poland at that, that point. I don't think you even knew that I was dating a woman in Poland. But I surprised you, and we were in this conversation around Poland. Magda was telling you something that was negative happening in Poland. And you said to her, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, you said, what's wrong with those people? <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah. And I just remember going like, oh my God. <laughs> because you were, you know, Magda's Polish. You basically asked her what was wrong with her without even, you were so angry about something. You, ha you had so much anger about Poland <laughs> that you didn't realize that you had, like totally insulted her to her face. Like you couldn't like connect the fact that Although Magda was Jewish, somehow you, I don't know, it was interesting, it was fascinating. But do you... Well, right from the start, I considered her one of us, a member of the tribe, so to speak. So it didn't, it wouldn't have occurred to me to think that she'd be insulted uh, as a Pole. Right? Um, I've learned since that she's very nationalistic and very proud of her country. I would say patriotic. I've, I've used the word nationalism before and I've had a lot of people yell at me. And I would say that Magda's patriotic, not nationalistic. Or, I don't know, she's not here, so I'm not gonna speak for my wife, because I'll get in trouble. What I, did, what I did recognize in you, in that moment, is that there, you, you seemed angry. You got angry very quickly. You had like anger. It felt like you had you were angry at Polish people, and I wonder if you can talk about your feelings. You know, honestly, like because obviously we're going to get to how they've shifted, but I think it's interesting that I feel like this hatred for Poland existed within us somehow. Would you agree with that statement? Um, yeah. Yes, and I had zero interest in visiting the country. I had very, in, zero interest in um, ever stepping foot in that country. And up until the time um, that um, you announced your wedding plans, um, I would have bet anything that we would will never be in Poland. There was no desire to be with Poles, Polish people, um, basically, they were the same as the Germans, the Germans. And to this day, uh, I still can't get over um, what the Germans did to the Jewish people. Um, it, it's irrational, but um, uh, we don't buy, I, I personally don't buy German products. It's, there's no good reason. I won't drive it. I won't own a German car. Um, and... Um, um, it's, it's still r r right from uh, every, every moment of my waking life, I can remember um, w what 
what's wrong with these people? Why, why have anything to do with uh, Germans or Poles? And I, I saw them in the same, um, in the same basket, if, if you will. And if you're a Polish person right now, I know you're getting angry. And I'm going to ask, why? They were complicit. They, they were the henchmen. They were the ones who executed the Germans' orders willingly. And um, um, I knew of too many firsthand stories of members from our community, um, social, social circles, or even um, synagogue where um, so-and-so was, uh, was um, uh, what's the word, denounced by a poll. Right, or given up, right. Given up by a poll. And then the same was true of Ukrainians, but that's what we're here to talk about. Uh -huh. And is that a narrative that you still that you still hold because you know a lot of people a lot of polish people um are are very um upset at, at this idea that poles are in like like would be very upset hearing that you had classified poles in the same basket as germans um because from the Polish perspective, they were, you know, they were, they were occupied. They were also being, they were an occupied country. They were, they, they were, they didn't, you know, as opposed to say Vichy, the Vichy government, they, they didn't give up Jew, Jews willingly. They, they fought and uh, they formed an underground, the, 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 the government, the, 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 um, the army was fighting underground. They were protect. They were trying to protect Jews, and there are also a lot of uh, Polish people who were trying to save Jews. And a lot of Polish people were murdered as a result of trying to save Jews. Um, You're right. Um, until I began traveling to Poland and speaking with Jews in Poland, and of course, with with you and our family. I, I didn't realize that it was actually six million Poles who were, who were murdered. Um, three million of them were non-Jewish. Mm -hmm. And that was a, an eye-opener to me. It didn't occur to me. And I didn't realize that there were laws that um, for um, hiding a Jew or not turning in a Jew, um, it would be the same thing for a Pole as for a Jewish person, mm. they would be instantly executed. So, um, why do you think that is? Why do you think that we, not why did those laws exist, but why do you think we didn't, don't know any of these things? Why do you think that we only get these narratives of, of Poles being complicit, of Poles giving up Jews? Why do we, why do we hold so few narratives of the Poles trying to s save Jews or the or the Polish plight? Uh, how can we only have these negative uh, narratives and stories that uh, sh shared with us? The, remember, this was a Holocaust survivor community. The majority of the Jewish people in this city um, were, were in fact survivors of uh, work camps, concentration camps, um, hiding in forests, and um, the, the level of trauma within the community, and even more so within my family, uh, our family, um, was off the charts. Um, this was uh, post-traumatic stress up until the day they died. There, there was no, um, n no getting away from it. And um, much of it has been transmitted to the second and even the third generation. So the, um, the transgenerational transmission of stress is, is a known and researched thing. And you don't, we don't even have to um, uh, say that we, we were lectured, if anything, to the contrary. Most of our family, they were too deeply traumatized 
to even tell us about their wartime stories. In fact, um, my first wife, your mom, um, didn't, didn't never heard of the stories from um, her mother and father. They, they just they couldn't talk about it. And to a certain extent, neither could, could my parents, or sorry, my grandparents. Most of the stories are coming from their siblings um, who have become educators uh, in the community, Holocaust educators, um, teaching, going into the school system, the public school systems uh, teaching about it. So they made a point of researching um, what happened to the Jews in, um, in Europe. Uh, but they, in the war years. You, you said that they couldn't talk about it, but yet at the same time, enough people talked about the negativity of Poles that somehow, you know, you put the Poles in the same basket as, as the Germans, which I, you know, and I, I, we'll, we'll talk about how that, uh, that has shifted for you. And I'm not saying, oh, you were doing a bad thing. I'm just more kind of curious as to how that that narrative uh, appeared because it's not, it's, yeah, how that narrative appeared, how we got so... Why didn't it change? Yeah. Why hasn't it changed? How did it happen to begin with? Because, like, we clearly know now, I mean, it's great that you are saying, okay, we didn't have this information about the six million, uh, three million non-Jewish Polish people, about the about the about the um, the fact that Poles would be murdered if they were caught trying to save Jews, and many were. We just sort of blamed Poles, and we for being as bad as Germans, which is so far from the truth. So I'm just curious as to how that narrative, like why that narrative actually exists. Yes, we know that some Polish people gave up Jews. My great grandmother, my Baba's mother was was given up for a cup of sugar also so this did happen but why is that like why, how did that turn into like jews hating polish people so much there was no reason to stop hating the remnants of the jewish population was so small um, that there was nobody to speak for the jewish people that survived and many of them themselves had to leave uh, go to displaced person camps in other countries and were absorbed by countries like Israel, USA, Canada, Australia. Um, so it had continued right through indefinitely um, beyond 1968, which I understood was another uh, difficult time. There were... Um, Something else we didn't know anything about, right? No, we not really. Um, not really. I mean, your, um, your auntie uh, and uncle, I, I, I didn't realize why they came, when they came in, in 68, 69. Who? Vujak and Uh-huh. All right. Vujak and Chocha. But you know what Vujak and Chocha mean? Vujak just means uncle and auntie. Auntie, yeah. But which, which, which one? Right. <laughs> Until growing up, we had like Vujak and Chocha, and we didn't, we, I thought that was their names. I thought, mm -hmm. I, I thought. I thought her name was Chacha and, and Vujek. Uh, and and no, one, no one actually explained that that was just Polish for, for uncle. But you mean, you mean my Zeta, Zeta Shimek's sister? Correct. Right. Yeah, their sister. Zeta, um, that's my mother's father. They were still living in Poland until, six, until after 68, After the war. Right? We heard stories about um, uh, clandestine trips to Poland being with prayer books being brought to the community and having to be very careful how they met people mm -hmm. that extended from russia too mm -hmm. but um, uh, um prayer books or the uh prayer shawls or phylacteries really? uh, being brought into poland mm -hmm. um, secretly by um, emissaries and it was very bad for them if they were caught Really, um, and meetings were held um, in 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 very uh, secret areas. Mm -hmm. So we heard more about this uh, as a as a uh, child 
growing up and going through Hebrew day school mm -hmm. than uh, almost um, the war because this was happening uh, as we spoke. This was current, current events mm -hmm. as opposed to the past. And all we knew was it was very sad mm -hmm. um, growing up as a child. So I would say that um, the formative years, our socialization years, um, uh, played a big role in answering your question mm -hmm. of why things haven't changed. Because of communism and the flow of information out of Poland to the rest of the world, there weren't really people uh, advocating for a, an alternative Polish narrative on behalf of like non-Jewish Polish people, right? Uh, and this and that government was highly anti-Semitic, right? Since the war. I mean, people would say that it changed after Stalin, after, after Stalin's death, because there were a lot of Jews actually. Uh, it's very confusing because it was anti-Semitic, but at the same time, there were far more, there were a lot of Jews in positions of power during Stalin's communist government. And then that started to change once Stalin died. And then communism started to, to change too, and anti-Semitism started to grow after Stalin's, Stalin's death. Okay. So this is all interesting. And so, okay, so we have this narrative around Poles, Polish people, or, or you, you, I certainly had it as well, to, that Poles were, were anti-Semitic, betrayers of the Jews during the, the war. And then you hear, okay, uh, Dad, I'm getting married in Poland. <laughs> and everyone's got to come. No, it started, you were getting married, and you were going to get married in Mexico. Oh, that's, that's how it right. started. It started in Mexico. Uh -huh. And I thought, that's great. You want to have a beach wedding? Mm -hmm. Count me in. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, then, fine. and then we changed it to Poland. No, you changed it to Vegas. Vegas, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't, I'll never forget these. And I thought, okay, you want to have Elvis at your wedding? Let's, viva Las Vegas. Let's go to Las Vegas uh -huh. and have the wedding there. Uh -huh. And that lasted for uh, about a week. Uh-huh. I actually forgot about this. Uh-huh. And then when did Poland come? Then it was Poland next? Then it was Poland. Then, then it was said, Poland. Wonderful. Mazel tov. Have a long life. Good health. Um, but I'm never stepping foot in that goddamn country. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, so when you heard, you were like, I'm not kind of going to your wedding? I'd never step... Let me correct it. I actually said God forsaken country. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you, at that point, had decided you weren't going to come to our wedding? No. No, I'm not going to Poland. Really? Why go to Poland? Do they, it's the place, it's just flowing, running with Jewish blood on the streets. Even though, even though I was getting married there. Right. Which is kind of part of the reason why we decided to get married in Poland. Because it would force you guys to have to come to Poland. Did you know that? When I tell the story to my friends, I say, you were very clever about this. It was soft. You didn't push for it. You, you began saying, okay, we understand my position. Mm -hmm. And uh, you let it go for a week, 10 days. And you said, you know, we would really like to have you at our wedding. Um, and uh, it will be a Jewish wedding. Um, uh, just come to the wedding. It's going to be just before Passover. And then you said something very interesting. He says, I'll even introduce you to someone, um, an observant Jew, whose father, whose father was a Nazi commander, oh. a German Nazi commander. Oh, oh, did I say that? Yeah. I don't know how that's a draw. Well, that was like a, the hook. Uh -huh. that's, uh, how could somebody be an observant Jew and their father um, be a, um, a German Nazi. What's the, what's the connection? How does that happen? So it was a hook. I was curious. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You didn't pursue it. You let it go for a few more days. And uh, we talked about it. And I said, well, you know, it's his wedding. We'll come and uh, we'll have the wedding. And then we'll get the hell out of the country and go to Israel for Passover. Uh-huh. Okay. And you understood. You said, okay, that, that's fine. 
you didn't push it. You were, you were not aggressive. You were um, um, very um, uh, careful with what you said. Um, you didn't want to go against my wishes because I would have fought you at the time. And, and then you, you, the next time you brought it up, you said, look, we'll have a wonderful kosher. We found you a nice place. It's brand new. It'll be kosher for Passover. Oh, yeah. It'll be uh, enjoyable. Come to us and have Passover with us. And uh, we relented and we came. Um, I was not looking forward to going to Poland at that point. Mm. Okay. And then you remember what happened? No. Tell me what happened. We arrived. Mm -hmm. uh, we were jet lagged. Um, and. All we wanted to do was sleep, and you said, hang on, before you go for sleep, I'd like you to come for a walk with me. Mm -hmm. It was come for a walk, and we went from the apartment um, up one block. Um, the apartment was at the corner of Miadova and I forget, but, but oh, very gosh. close to... Uh, I think it was like Miadova and Brzozowa or something like that. Brzozowa, yeah, Brzozowa, right. And we walked for a block. And you said, this is um, a Jewish cemetery. And I'm looking around. I thought, well, it's going to be ruins. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to be covered with blood. And we walked, and it was two blocks, three blocks, four blocks. And this was a Jewish cemetery. I could peek in inside the gates, and I could see Jewish gravestones that hadn't been toppled or covered with blood. And so I began thinking, what's going on here? Where am I? And then we turned the corner. And of course, by then we were in Soroka, Soroka Square. Sure, yeah. Soroka Square. And you began pointing out, and I'm seeing Jewish names on buildings, on restaurants. And they're not destroyed. They're not bombed. Um, and all of a sudden, this is... The first synagogue I remember seeing was the Ramu. And from my own education, I'd learned about the Rama, uh, Iserlis, and his synagogue is here, his grave is here, and it's not been destroyed. Um, so at that point, it became, uh, that was when I began questioning my own beliefs. And um, it was, uh, we hadn't really gone in. I think we did go into the cemetery. Um, we had this, we snuck in without paying the ten zloty because uh, I just pushed my way in. I went to see it, and and I saw it. There was the tombstone, the grave, uh, the we refer to it as the the ohel of uh, the great um, sage of modern Ashkenazi Judaism, um, and things just uh, I guess I can't say gone went downhill from there, but they. They went uh, crazy, crazier from there. What do you mean? Why? What do you mean by crazier? Well, you pointed out we were staying uh, three blocks from uh, another synagogue, the Temple Synagogue, and across the street was another synagogue. Um, and uh, at the other corner was a Jewish community center. We had no idea any of these things existed. We didn't know that Kajimirsh um, was the Jewish town and center of of uh, Krakow as well. Um, it had not, Krakow was not destroyed because the Germans had intentions of putting their own uh, Volksdeutsch into that country. And uh, there's this gorgeous, beautiful, preserved medieval town um, that was home of so many Jews um, and still carries this this strong memory and continuation of, of Jewish life. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, we began, I met the uh, observant, met Uva and his wife, Beata, mm -hmm. who confirmed. Uh, uh, not Beata, Uva and Gabi. Gati, sorry, Gabi, um, who in fact told me their story in their own words, and uh, it was jaw dropping. But uh, true uh, to um, Krakowian Jews, um, and I met uh, more, 
and I be I met someone who um, discovered uh, discovered the idea of hidden Jews, Jews who uh, were raised as uh, the children of Polish Catholics, or grand or uh, children of children um, whose parents put them with Poles to be saved, and they were raised as uh, Catholics or Christians, and they're discovering their Jewishness and emerging, which I came to learn was one of the functions of um, the synagogues in Poland was to receive and accept these um, Poles who were discovering that they have uh, Jewish roots. At what point did you then start to say, shift uh, your perception about um, about let's say like the pole the, the non-jewish polish experience or the non like your perception of non-jewish polish people right now we're talking about jews and of course the jews are a really jews are a really important entry point into into poland and i would say you know i agree with you or i had a very similar feeling this kind of the magic of being able to kind of feel and almost like taste or, 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 or sit in the context of our, of our histories because of the architecture and the cemeteries and the things that still exist, which is something that we, we can't do here in Winnipeg. Uh, the Jewish community here is not very old and it's primarily made up of a lot of uh, survivors who moved to to Winnipeg. But at what point did you become, say, interested in non-Jewish Poles as well? And at what point did you start to understand that uh, experience or more about that experience? It probably wasn't in our first trip. Um, it was Passover and um, we had a lot going on to do with that, um, getting um, food that was kosher, suitable for Passover, trying to have as much of a Passover there as we would have here. And it was actually easy. It was delightful. There's kosher food. Um, the, uh, the home was brand, was recently refurbished and uh, it was, everything was new. So uh, it wasn't, a lot of work getting ready for, for Passover. For those who don't know, on Passover, you have to use a whole different set of dishes that are kosher specifically, kosher specifically for Passover, because you're not allowed to have bread during Passover. There's a whole bunch of reasons why, but it's a huge undertaking to make a kitchen, to prepare a kitchen for Passover. But because this was a brand new kitchen, you, it, it was like it was it could start as a kitchen that was kosher for Passover and we, we, we found that specifically to make it more comfortable for you guys. Yeah, and yeah. you had a friend that came in for a couple of days and koshered the oven and made sure everything she was an observant uh, practicing Jew and uh, we trusted her. I, I talked to her and uh, she made a lot of effort and into mm. making sure that everything was kosher mm, yes. in the kitchen in the, in the house. Mm. So uh, everything was, was, was Jewish that first trip. Maybe it was just as well because um, it was just talking to Polish Jews, um, mostly your peers, your friends, um, your age group um, was, was quite useful. Um, there were others, but they were Polish speaking and um, either we weren't ready or we just didn't have the opportunity um, from either the wedding or the wedding party or the, the receptions afterwards. Um, it was... Uh, yeah, it was a pretty whirlwind trip. Lots yeah, of events pretty, and... pretty Jewish. And I don't think we traveled anywhere. Yeah. Um, we, we just stayed in the city and then... Uh, left and went home after Passover. We stayed for the entire Passover. 
Yeah, and in a way, I think it's good, like the journey for you know, the kind of Jew you are with the kind of narrative that you have. It's like, it's like to, to kind of get you comfortable with the idea of Poland again, or at all, it, it helps to have that Jewish entry point, right? So one episode or one event that is uh, that stays with me is meeting um, Professor Weber, Dr. Okay. Weber and his wife at your wedding in um, the Estara uh, synagogue, which at the time I didn't realize was itself a, s a special um, location. I, I, we walked through and we saw it was a museum, but we didn't realize how special it was to get permission to have your wedding there. Um, and Dr. Weber uh, made a point of, pulled me over um, as I was running after the wedding party. That's why I was late. I missed I the we walk. Were, we were all waiting you for were, you. You were yelling at me afterwards saying, what were you doing? And I'm talking to this professor who I didn't realize his uh, pedigree and his who he was. But uh, um, he said, make sure we do, um, we visit the uh, Galicia Jewish Museum and the cemetery um, in uh, just outside of Kajimirsh. He was the first person outside of family that I began to talk to. You came, you had the you came for the wedding. There was a, you came for Pesach. You've had the whole, I don't even rem I don't remember how long you were in Poland. Uh, but you started with like, I don't even want to go. You weren't looking forward to it. And then you came. And you had this experience in Poland, and then you came back here to Winnipeg. And what was going on in your brain? At that time, my perception had changed, and I was curious to know what was the, um, the modern, contemporary Poland like, and how was it for the Jews? Mm. Um, I remember going to a synagogue, and... Um, I, I asked people in the synagogue, what's it like? How dangerous is it for the Jew? How safe is it? What can we do? And one of the uh, lay leaders in the synagogue said, it's, there's no anti-Semitism. It's banned. There is no anti-Semitism. And he says, I can walk down the street with my head covering, my kippah, and have absolutely no fear, which was mind-blowing to me because even at that point, I was still trying to hide my Jewishness uh, for fear that um, someone would come out of the hall, uh, the the aisle, or the hall, the uh, the uh, the lane, and uh, attack me. And he says, "No, try it." And I did. I wore my my head covering for um, almost uh, almost a week. Um, throughout the streets of Kajimirsh. Um, and that's something that, and, and absolutely no one even looked at me. No one paid any attention. Um, I couldn't do that in my home city. In, here in Winnipeg? In Canada. It's funny, I, I, made, I made a video once talking about how it was ironic that I felt safer in Poland uh, right now than I would say in Canada, given the, given the war in Israel. And I had a lot of people, like rightly so, like, why would it be ironic that you feel safe in Poland, given the fact that Poland was, for the longest time, the best place in the world for the Jews. Like, the Jews were living in Poland because it was safer in Poland for Jews than anywhere else in the world. Of course, that changed uh, after the war, or, or Amer North America became... Uh, you know, a safer place for Jews. But I think a lot of Polish people would say that Poland has always been safe for the Jews. And when it stopped being safe for the Jews, it had nothing to do with Polish people. It was because of the Germans. The Germans were the ones who were occupying Poland. The Germans were the ones who had made it unsafe for Jews. Why should Jews not feel safe in Poland outside of the context of World War II. During the war, we learned that the Jewish people had to be in hiding, whether it was um, in the forests um, or um, 
under their with their own uh, resources to try and stay alive, uh, but the rest were deported uh, to concentration camps or work camps, and uh, most died there. I think what, what did I hear? Two hundred thousand survived um, mm -hmm. the concentration camps. But but uh, who was responsible? Um, because it was in the in the country of Poland, I uh, have always I always assumed that the Poles were complicit, and that um, the Jews had to hide from Poles as well. And, and 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 you had no information about the number of Polish people who were righteous among the nation. Not until later, not until recent, not until later trips, and. Um, uh, I learned that the greatest number of uh, righteous Jews were from Poland. Righteous Poles. Righteous Poles, yeah. right, um, who did either save or lose their lives um, trying to save Jews. And it's I'm not saying it because somehow there's something wrong with you or there's a problem. It's very common. It's a very common and interesting perspective. And I think it's interesting for Poles because it's very confusing for Polish people why Jews dislike Poland so much. A lot of people don't understand. And it's also, you know, when you kind of break down the facts, it's interesting to me just how little, just how much we blame Polish people for something that was not their fault. <laughs> it's interesting just how many people assume that Polish people were complicit. Not to say that there were not people who were complicit, Emotionally, I still wonder about um, how many Poles really helped Jews. I'm going to say there's an emotional side and an intellectual side. Emotionally, um, there were 7,500 um, proven cases of, of uh, Poles saving Jews and receiving the medallions for uh, righteous Gentile. Um, and even if, if that number is too low, as some would say, the requirements to receive these, the, that recognition and the medallions uh, are very stringent. There has to be first-hand evidence. So even if you say it was double, triple that number, some would say that, that there are. And there are other organizations, I've, I've since learned, um, who uh, are giving rewards other than Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Um, but what was it, where were the rest? What about, what were the rest of the Poles? Why didn't more Poles step up? Mm -hmm. That's the emotional side of me. Intellectually, I've come to understand that the Poles' lives them, themselves, they were in danger and um, they were trying to survive as best they could. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but still, there's that question in the back of my head. Um, and I would like to spend more time talking to descendants of uh, that generation um, and hear the stories of their family um, and uh, how they um, survived, got through the war. Um, as I've learned or come to learn, uh, the Poles were considered second-class class citizens, uh, maybe just one step better than gypsies, um, and they themselves were, con were, were um, slotted or destined to become um, slaves or workers for the German people. Um, they weren't worth anything more than that. So that that's a... Um, a difficult thing to uh, to get my head around, but um, I believe it's true. That's how they were described, uh, both in literature. Mm. On the other hand, I I have read books. Um, um, the most recent that I'm waiting for is uh, "It's Still Night" or "Dale." Or it's still Dale night. Nuts? I don't know. I don't know what the title is. I think so, um, which was edited by uh, Jan Grabowski and Barbara Engelking, um, 
and um, other stories, like survivor stories um, of, uh, of uh, people, how they survived, and um, some on their own, but many with the kindness of uh, non-Jewish Poles. I don't know if you know, but like uh, you probably remember the trial. The very, there's a very infamous trial where where Grabowski and Engelking were put on trial by the former Polish government for for like treason <laughs> because yeah, besmirching the good name of Poland. Yeah, and they were they were let off. Thank goodness. I know a lot of people have problems with Grabowski uh, as a writer. Uh, a lot of people feel like he's. Uh, he accentuates things, or they feel like he's not an actual. It's hard. To, it's hard for me to actually know, right? Because, you know, whenever people are 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 writing books that defames Polish people, they're going to not like it. <laughs> they're not going to like it. And I understand the perspective that Polish people have because it's like, it's like, God, like, like. We we suffered we suffered com we suffered uh, Poles suffered too, and no one gave a shit. And there was forty years of communism, where they weren't even allowed to d negotiate the fact that they had suffered, while at the same time, like you know, Jews were starting to well, Jews got Israel. Poles got communism. And Jews, you know, the narrative, the Holocaust narrative, was starting to to. To, to really be told by Jewish people, and Polish people had very little opportunity to do that for themselves. Then communism finally ended, and suddenly, like, the only really loud conversations that are happening about Poland are the ones that Jan Gross started with neighbors, and then Grabowski and Engel King, like people who are basically shitting on Poles <laughs> for the places where they were culprits during the war. And like no one's talking about the other stuff on a kind of global scale. And people say that Grabowski's not an act, like he's not a, a historian, that he's not actually a historian. And so there's, and again, like this is not me saying that I'm against Grabowski. I, uh, I, we're Facebook friends. Uh, <laughs> I mean, why do you say that? Um, the, 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 the large work that he, the most recent work that he did, um, is a, a work of, of documented history. He did travel and he, he did um, investigate um, cases, um, stories of the blue police. You're, you're right that he, he, he does, he omits two things. He omits talking about um, um, saving Jews or where there was some good. Um, I think he says in his work that's not his job, that's not his place. And um, he also forgets to say uh, a very important um, uh, philosophy, which I, I think is worldwide, but we call it a Jewish uh, piece of philosophy that the sins of the father do not travel to the the children. Um, uh, the father can be the worst uh, beast, uh, murdering creature there, but this the children are still innocent, and they are to be judged on their own merits. And I guess that's my hope that. Um, um, there is um, a, uh, a new theme. The one thing I would just say that, like the, the, the stuff about the sins of the father are not necessarily the sins of the child. I would say that this is a kind of, um, this, this is something that for me I think applies and is more important to apply to Germans. Than, than Poles per se, because I don't feel like, I feel like for, for Polish people, and of course, you know, if, if there is a Polish person who's, whose ancestors did do something bad to Jewish people, 
then yes, absolutely. Um, whereas in Germany, you know, everyone's got a Nazi in their family. <laughs> but in Poland, like, the majority of Polish people did not do things to harm Jewish people. The majority just did nothing. And in, it's a question of if we consider that to be a sin. Which, crimes, crimes by omission. But, you know, like, what would you do? Okay, let's say, let's say um, you, you, you know, someone came in and, and the indigenous people of, of, of Canada were being, were being hunted. And, and um, let's say me and my, it me was, and Sarah. It was them or me? Yeah. Like, would you, would you say, would you risk your life to, to, to hide someone knowing that like your young children could be murdered if you were caught? I mean, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer. It's an existential question. It's a very it's, difficult question to answer, right? Yeah. But I think this is the question that every single Polish person was faced, faced with, right? Like, would you risk your life to save this other I would hope that I would, but I'm not sure. Like if my son, if I knew that my son could be murdered if, 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 if I was caught sa saving someone, it's a really, and so to sort of say, oh, it, this is a, a sin to not do it, to choose your family over trying to save somebody else, I think it's hard, I think it's hard to pass judgment on that. I think it's very hard to say this, you know, that that's a sin by the, the not doing it was a sin. I think that probably a lot more people wish they could have done more. I think there's an interesting, I think that an interesting thing happened during, like during, like right now with Ukrainian people, where I think a lot of Polish people really stepped up and they, you know, Polish people really did amazing things with Ukrainian people in, in a way that was surprising for all of even Polish people, everyone's like, we can't believe everyone's helping. Everyone is helping. And I, there have been some thoughts that like part of, part of that might connect to the fact that uh, people wish that Polish people did or could have done more during the Second World War for Jews, but they didn't have that freedom, whereas now there's this freedom that Polish people have to help. Their lives are not in danger. And Polish people did. I think they wanted to show the world, like, this is who Poland is. This is who Polish people are. Look at what we... And I think they made a really strong statement as a result. I don't think us uh, North Americans realize uh, the extent to which um, the country was uh, almost, you'd call it, mobilized to um, look after, to save Ukrainians as well as... Um, uh, raise funds to um, support the the home front, the guard, the, the Polish army, sorry, the Ukrainian army um, with um, uh, materials and uh, um, armaments um, to go to battle and defend their country. What did I hear at one point? It was up to three million Ukrainians. Yeah, had, uh, at one point there was... Had, as many moved. Ukrainians as there were Jews before the war. Mm. Yeah. Right. And um, even in my own city, I'm amazed of the number of Ukrainians that have been taken in. Mind you, they're on a uh, three-year visa. Mm. Um, uh, so the jury is still out on what's going to happen mm -hmm. after those expire, but we did, we've done a lot, but nothing compared to what Poland had done and and continues to do. People just aren't reading as much mm -hmm. about it. It's like the war hasn't gotten any better. It's just that, you know, everyone's focused on Israel now. <laughs> everyone's focused on Israel. Well, like, Ukraine is like, hey, we're still being attacked by Russia. So I would like to sort of sum up sort of where you were, where you stand now uh, in relationship to Poland, your feelings about Poland now. Uh, versus your, your feelings about Poland, um, you know, say prior to uh, my wedding, 
or prior to starting to come. And also, you know, the fact that I now like live there. Uh, I've moved there permanently. I'm a permanent, I'm a citizen of Poland. I have a family in Poland. I have a grandson in Poland. How do you feel about all of this stuff? I'm looking forward to returning. And um, there's only so much one can absorb in a two or three week trip. Um, first of all, we have commitments, responsibilities. We have friends now uh, that we want to see and family. I love the feeling of being immersed in a foreign culture and um, uh, literally uh, confused and then all of a sudden understanding comes. So I can't wait to go back um, if at all possible. And I, I'm, in, I'm in a different place at this point. I'm now at the point where among my friends and peer group, I find myself defending um, Polish people and Poland, um, which is unheard of, say, 10 years ago. Um, some don't want to hear it. Some are, are like that, like I was. Some I have encouraged, let's go, let me, let me take you there, let me show you um, what, what exists. It's more than just a cemetery of the Jews. There, there are Jews who are, who are thriving and living there. Um, some of them will say, well, how else? It's, of course you're going to feel that way. It's, your son has, has moved, moved there. So of course um, it's expected uh, that I should feel that way. I'm, I've, I've changed. I, uh, and it, and it's, it's great how it happened because um, my beliefs were, um, were incomplete, if not wrong. Mm. Cool. It's cool to hear you talk about, like, I can't wait to go back, I can't wait to go back. And do you being so grumpy about, you know, me having a wedding there nine years ago. And now, nice. Okay. So... Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. My father, Kerry Rubenfeld, straight from Winnipeg. Um, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Um, if you uh, liked uh, this video and you'd like more content like this, remember to like and subscribe. If you'd really like to support me, I, I have started a Patreon account. Patreon dot com slash Michael Rubenfeld. Uh, don't you want to make my father proud by by su supporting me uh, in, in making this? Kind of, wouldn't it make you proud? We've done it for decades. Now it's their turn. There you go. So you know what are you waiting for? Look at how look at how scary he is. He'll, he'll come after you. Yeah. Anyways, thanks a lot, and. Uh, Chag Sameach. Happy, happy Pesach. And Kochame uh, Polska. Bye-bye.